Amen. Who said those Latin lessons wouldn't come into use? <laughs> yeah. All the kids are like, no. Hey, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That was awesome. Thanks, guys. Amen. <clears throat> All the adults are going, what Latin lessons? <laughs> they didn't teach us that when we were kids, did they? Man, that was good. Thank you, guys. Aren't you glad for the peace of God? Yes. The Bible says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter number 5. If you take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of 2 John. We have made our way through the book of 1 John, and so naturally, it seems like we should just keep on going. And so we're going to start the book of 2 John this morning. In the book of 1 John, there was a lot of really grand declarations. God is light, in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. But if we sin, we know we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. These are things we can have confidence in our salvation. Chapter 5, verse 13, we can have confidence in the coming judgment. We can have confidence in our prayer. Hey, this, it's all based upon truth, knowing the truth, knowing the truth. I, aren't you glad you know the truth? I think about, I was thinking about this, some of the truth that I know. Here, here's some truth that I know, that when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish, but, present tense, have everlasting life. Amen. And I'm thankful for the truth that I have everlasting life. I'm thankful for the truth. Now, there, there, now therefore, there is no condemnation. Amen. Right? And those that know Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. I'm thankful for the truth of being confident of this very thing, that He hath begun a good work in you, will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for the truth that we are co-heirs and co-laborers with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for the truth. Behold, what manner of love that God has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Man, I'm thankful that I know the truth. 1 John was about the declaration of knowing the truth because that truth was being uh, combated. It was under attack, especially the physicality of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, the big debate in 1 John, which will continue in 2 John, is debate of truth that comes from God or Gnosticism, the truth that comes from man. That is the big debate. Where do we get truth? Do we get truth from God via His Word or do we get truth from man? And that's what John was debating. And he basically was saying this, God is light. He is the source of truth. You can know truth through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Where those that were debating him were saying, no, no, I am the author of truth. I have experienced truth. I have figured out truth. I've come to realize what truth is. Friend, truth is truth. And you know it through the scripture, through God's word. Amen. So I'm thankful that we know truth. And here's what he says in 2 John chapter number 1. Look what it says. The elder John unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Okay, let me stop for a minute. Let's get through the little bit of a theological debate real quick. There's some debate over whether this elect lady and her children is a lady and her children, or it is a specific church and the people that are in it. You ready for the answer? I have no idea. <laughs> I think you can make an argument for either one. And I think, praise the Lord, that truth that we're going to talk about is applicable to either one. Okay? I read some arguments. Well, it can't be a lady because John would not address a lady. Says who? Right? Paul did. Right? Well, there weren't no any important ladies. Really? Really? 
Who, Mary, the mother of Mark, you know, and Martha, and, and, and Tabitha, which is called Dorcas, you know. I mean, there's lots of ladies and some ladies that had churches in their house. It could be a lady that has her children that also has a church in her house that has people in it. Amen. I have no idea. But here I, what I, what, here's what I do know. It's written to believers. Amen. It's written to believers. He says that he has loved them in the truth and that they have known the truth. You get a theme here? Okay, verse number two. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Man, that's pretty good. That the truth is in us because we've accepted the truth and will dwell with us forever. Okay? I know the truth. I have received of the truth and the truth will be with me forever. By the way, guess who the truth is? Jesus Christ. He is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he says in greeting to them, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ and the Son of the Father in truth and love. If you want to know what John's themes are throughout his epistles, truth and love. Man, what a great balance. Truth and love. Both of them are necessary. Okay? Sometimes we might major on the one and forget the other. John, he puts, him, he puts truth on one side and love on the other side and says, I need you to operate within these two. And so he's giving this, this declaration to these believers that they have known the truth, he has loved them in the truth, and the truth has been in them and will be in them forever, and they have the mercy of God and the grace of God, and even the Lord Jesus Christ in truth and love. And, I mean, that's just encouraging to me that we know the truth. Then he changes and he tells them why he's rejoicing. He tells them why he's rejoicing. Look what it says in verse number four. I rejoice greatly that I found of, thee, of thy children walking in truth. As we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady... Not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which ye have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. And this is the commandment that ye have heard from the beginning, that ye should walk in it. And so he's telling, I'm thankful that you know the truth, man. It's exciting. You know the truth. I love you in the truth. You got the truth of the love of God and Christ Jesus. And he's talking about truth. Truth, truth. But you know what really makes him excited? To hear that they're walking in truth. Amen. I was thinking the other day, I'm, I have made this statement numerous times throughout my ministry. And it's not a wrong statement, okay? So I, I don't have to go back and do some recanting and erase a bunch of sermons yet. <laughs> I made this statement, I made this statement a lot, and, and it's not wrong, but to be honest, it's just more complicated than I'm making it. I've made this statement before. People don't change from the outside in. Now, some of you are getting nervous, right? <laughs> People don't change from the outside in. And that's true. Hey, can, I, can I tell you, first of all, that we had to believe in our heart in the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with our mouth, okay? Romans chapter number nine. Uh, and so we, we have to believe that, and that happens. But I've, I, I've made it, okay, if I'm going to apologize to you, let me apologize for some shallow teaching. I've made it at times very lateral. Here's the reason that I've made it lateral. Because there has been some negative, wrong method teaching that believe that you could change people from the outside in. Right? If we can just get them to do this, then they'll love God, okay? If we can just get our children to, to eat broccoli, they'll like broccoli, right? It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily work that way. And, we've, and because of that negative response, and, and so how do we get people to change from the outside in? Well, we use some of the best methods we have. We guilt them into it, right? 
We, we start shaking our religious jowls. You ever shake your jowls? Like, How dare you do that before? And we guilt them. You're like, okay, I don't want to be guilty. And so we create these conformity robots and they do what they're supposed to do. Look, look, are they looking? Okay, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And, and there has been a lot of method to try to, and, and we, don't want, we don't want to do that, do we? First of all, it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. Second of all, it's a lot of work <laughs> to try to change people from the outside in. I mean, you've got to be watching them and judging them and hating them. It's just a lot of work. <laughs> and so we don't want to do that. We're like, we don't want to change people from the outside in. So we're like, oh, so we need their insides to change. And so we had a negative, we, us, us, us religious types, you know, we had a negative response. We don't want people to change we on, on, the, uh, on the outside in, so it's got to be on the inside. God will change you on the inside. So when he changes you, just get ready. He'll do it. And that sounded really good. The problem is there's a lot of Christians who are waiting for God to do something. Just waiting. I mean, I wouldn't be this way, but if God would change me. See, the truth is, He's already giving you the truth and the material. And there has to be an acceptance and a believing of the truth. But can I tell you, there is an expectation that the truth would not just be known, but that the truth would be shown. There is an expectation. And so we have sometimes made that teaching very lateral. People try to change from the outside in. No, you can't do that. It has to be from the inside out. To be honest, if I was going to be honest, the way the scripture presents it, it's, it's almost cyclical. God changes us on the inside, it shows on the outside. God changes us on the inside, it shows on the outside. God changes us on the inside, it shows on the outside. And there's a growth that is associated with it. And guess what? We know the truth, which means that we're allowed to participate in the process. That's called walking. Have you ever, any of you guys ever seen that movie um, Up? You ever seen that movie Up? Okay, I have children, okay? So I've seen that movie Up. In the movie Up, you remember the dog that is constantly distracted by the squirrels? Right? Squirrel! You know, pshoo, off the side. You know how annoying it would be to walk that dog? <laughs> right? We had a dog like that when we lived over in Spring Hill, and, and I, I, I never walked him. I had children. I mentioned that. <laughs> and, and so I remember one time Jackson was, had, had been walking the dog, and then he ended up like rollerblading the dog, and the dog would run. He'd rollerblade. But if a squirrel came out, watch out, man. I remember one time I saw Jackson, he was staggering back to the house, you know, broken and bleeding. I'm like, dude, what happened? He said, we were going fast on the rollerblades and there was a squirrel and the dog took a 90 degree turn. <laughs> it was a big dog, man. The dog went choom and Jackson went whoo, through the air, bam, 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 like skipped. <laughs> Where's the video when you need it, you know? And he's coming back, he's all scraped up, you know, and I'm like, that is awesome. That's going to be some great scars, you know, and his mother was like, Jackson, <laughs> you know, and, and it was because that dog was constantly distracted, okay? In other words, so distracted that he forgot who the master was. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of Christians that are not walking in truth. They're wandering in truth, waiting to be distracted. And when they're distracted, and they dart off to this, and they dart off to that, you know what really is a declaration? I've forgotten who the Master is. I've forgotten who the Master is. Aren't you ever jealous? Are you jealous of that guy on TV who's like the dog whisperer? <laughs> it's annoying. He'll come in and that dog is like dragging the master down the, down the road, you know, like hold, and he'll come in and he'll be like, you know, and, and all of a sudden that dog will walk right next to him and he'll stop and the dog will stop. I mean, it's like almost enjoyable to have a dog at that point. 
Because the dog knows who the master is. And sometimes we're thankful that we know the truth. But walking is a deliberate activity based upon the knowledge provided of the path with an intention to reach a specific destination. And Paul said, man, you know what I'm excited about? Some of your children are walking in the truth. Others of you are celebrating the knowledge of the truth. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But you know what I'm excited about? Those of you that are walking in the truth. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we got to tell, hey, this is not a new thing. Let's go through it and not get ahead of ourselves. Look what it says in verse number four. I rejoice greatly that I found some of, of thy children or some of thy children walking in truth as ye have received a commandment from the Father. Okay? First of all, this walking in truth is not self-directed. It is obedient directed. It is not a discovery of life. It is following the instructions of life. Okay? I, I, I drive my wife insane sometimes. We'll be driving, especially when we're in Spring Hill. And you ever been in the maze of, of Spring Hill? And you don't know where that big, huge retention pond is. And you, can, you have to use certain roads to get from 19 to Mariner. And I'll be like, we'll go to a yard sale or something. And I'll be like, let's not take the main roads. Let's just wander our way back. <laughs> She's like, oh, you're going to get us lost. I know the general direction. It's like a discovery. Amen. Right? And here we go. And we come to a dead end. I'm like, oh, okay. And there's been numerous times we finally made it to that place where it says no outlet. I'm like, there's no shopping mall here. Let's keep going, you know. And you have to turn around and go all the way back. Listen, she's like, you know the way to go. Why not just go the way that you know to go? Hey, there's Christians that are discovering life and life is too dangerous to discover when it has already been directed. He says, I'm excited that you're walking not based upon your own will or your own conclusions, but based upon the commandment given. Okay, that's what he says. He says, as we have received a commandment from the Father, verse 5, and now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment, unto thee, but that which is had from the beginning that we love one another. This is not a new discovery. This commandment that we're supposed to be walking in and, and, and proceeding in, it's not something that's new. It's something that we've known from the beginning that we were to be continuing. It's the right path. Stay on the right path. Well, what's that path? Look what he says in verse number five. That ye love one another. Now, can I stop? Is that the only commandment? Well, no, but to be honest, this is associated with the greatest commandment, right? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and thy mind and love thy neighbor as thyself. It's a fairly, it's a fairly inclusive commandment, okay? In other words, you say, sometimes I struggle with selfishness. Anybody ever struggle with selfishness, right? Okay, well, I just don't know how to overcome selfishness. Here's how you overcome selfishness. Love one another. It's hard to be selfish while you're loving other people. It's difficult. I struggle with envy. Uh, you know how you overcome envy? Love one another. Amen. I struggle with self-worth. You know how you overcome the struggle with self-worth? Love other people. I struggle with greed. I struggle with lust. You want, you, can I help you understand how to help you overcome lust? Love one another. Because you're not going to be able to look at that person with that lust if you actually understand their value as a human and love them as an individual. Right, hey, it's not a new commandment. You're like, well, I just thought there'd be more details. Hey, that's an that's a all-encompassing, much-solving commandment that if you were going to walk in this, you're like, oh, well, of course I love people. <laughs> no, no, he's not talking conceptually. He's talking actually. That's the difference between knowing the truth and walking in the truth. In other words, you've got to put a face on it. You've got to put a face on it. You have to love that person. Is there any that persons that you struggle loving? 
You're like, I got a list. <laughs> yeah, me too. I think I'm on a few lists, to be honest with you. Right? You're like, oh man, but it's so hard. Hold on, hold on. When it's difficult, revert to what you know. Like, how could I love people? How could I forgive people? You know what Jesus said? Forgive others as I have forgiven you. So I revert to what I know, then I, have, I, then I understand what I need to show. Like, oh, but I don't understand. This person is my adversary. They're my enemy. Oh, got one for that too. Love your enemies. Pray for them that despitefully use you. You're like, man, this is annoying. I can't do anything I want. Yeah, but you got all the, inf all the knowledge to do everything he wants you to do. But this is not on accident. This is not on accident. This is on purpose. Okay? We're going to see as we go through this book that this path we're walking on is not just a road that can be wandered, but there are many pitfalls and there are many deceivers and there are many missteps. So it is intentional that I'm going to walk according to this commandment. I have to love one another. I have to love them in the truth. What is love? Love is obeying the commandments. Look what it says in the next verse. It says this in verse number 5. It says, I, now I beseech you, lady, not as though I write a new commandment unto thee, but that which you have heard from the beginning, that you love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. You're like, that's new. Actually, it's not. What did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. But this is not, uh, this is not just a general direction of life. This is an intentional step through life. This is how Christians operate in the general direction. Well, I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm not as bad as that guy. I haven't killed anybody. You know, I haven't committed any of the big ones. And they're moving in a general direction. Well, I could be a lot worse. Hey, that doesn't make John excited. Can you imagine? John's like, how's things going? I could be a lot worse. <laughs> Yay. You know, parents get home. Like, how's the house? It could be worse. <laughs> no, that's not exciting. That, that's not exciting. What'd you do? Kids, what'd you do while we were gone? Stuff. That's scary, not exciting. See, this walk of the commandment is intentional where there's a step. You say, I mean, like each and every step, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Okay? And so he says, okay, I need to do this. I need to do this. He say, what, what if I misstep? If we, have, if we sin, we have an advocate. And we can get forgiveness and cleansing. And praise God for his grace that the truth is in us for how long? Forever. And he can get us right back on track. But we are to be walking. What makes the Apostle John excited, what makes the Lord Jesus excited, is not just that we know the truth, but that we on purpose Walk in it according to his commandments. And not just a general direction, but a specific step. And you know what's really cool? Is some of the steps that I have to take may not be exactly the steps that you have to take. I may have to take some steps that have to be very careful because I have a temper. You may not have to take that step because you're perfect and holy. <laughs> <laughs> get mad here, right? I have to take that step. I have to take that step because my bent is to care only what I think. That's my bent. You may have to take a different step because you care what everybody else thinks. It's a different step, right? God's not saying, you need to care what everybody else thinks uh, or you need, to, you need to care about your own opinion. No, no. He's like, oh, I know what that guy needs. He needs to pay attention to people around him, not just himself. Yes, Lord. Why do I do that? Well, because I want to love people and love him. I want to walk in the truth. And I'm taking this step. It's a step of obedience. Deceivers, you, you go ahead and read the rest of the chapter. Hey, if you read the rest of the book this week, go ahead. There's some deceivers that are coming. Now, let me just show you something real quick. 
It says this, verse number six, and this is love that you walk after his commandment. And this is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning. Ye should walk in it. A specific direction. Let me give you an example of this. Okay. James chapter number four. Now, where you, while you're turning there, let me just ask if you can respond to some examples. Okay? Uh, some re truth. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Walk in it. Be anxious or be careful for. Are you walking in it? Finally, brethren, he gives this list. Whatsoever things are honest or just a good report, virtue, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. How you doing? You're like, knowing the truth is a lot easier than walking in the truth. Right? Amen. Can, can, can I ask you a question? Is there anything in you that is combating the truth that you know? Oh, yeah. James chapter 4. Look what it says. From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even from your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, ye cannot obtain, ye fight and war, and, and yet ye have not, because ye ask not, ye ask not and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it on your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain that the spirit dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Man, there is opposition to the truth that I know. There's opposition to the truth that I know. Okay, I'll give you an example. Truth that I know. Eating healthy is good for me. Right, is that a truth that I know? Okay. Is there opposition to that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's the lust that dwelleth in me. And I sit down in front of that piece of whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, the truth. And some, some skinny jogger says to me, and the truth shall set you free. Yeah, free to knock you out so I can have your piece too. <laughs> right? There's something in me that goes, no, I want it. I want that. Okay? And then I consume it upon my lust. <laughs> there is opposition to this following in the commandment. And so I have to recognize that, that there is something within me that is drawing me away. Look what he says, the solution. I mean, this is pretty harsh, James says. By the way, James is not talking to the world. He's writing to believers. And he says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Whoa. So how do I deal with this opposition? If I'm going to walk, I don't want to just know it. I don't want to just think it. I don't want to just have an eye. I want to actually do it. Look what he says in verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. He said, listen, if you want to overcome that which is adversarial to your walk, you need to first humble yourself and realize that God's truth is what needs to be followed, and humble yourself, and God will give you grace. And then when you submit to God and say, resist the devil, man, the path becomes clear that you need to take. And you can take that first step and you take that next step. And as you take step, God reveals. Yeah, but there's something that's going to mess up that next step. So cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And you continue forth in that path. You're like, yeah, but I, I know I'm going to get tripped up. You have to be willing to view the opposition as the enemy it is. Look what it says in this passage. This is pretty straightforward stuff. Look what it says in verse number nine. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. He said, well, you're going to, this enemy that you have to actually view it as an enemy. 
That which is opposing your ability to show forth the truth and declare the truth and walk in the truth, you have to say, no, this is not right. This is contrary to what God wants. And you have to humble yourself and God will show you the next step to take. Next step to take. You say, but that's just a concept. I want it to get practical. James, look what it says in verse number 11. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brethren judges his brethren, speaketh evil of the law, and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, art thou not a doer of the law, but a judge? There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judges another? So it gets real practical. In this moment, you look around and you say, okay, I have to be obedient to the Lord. My obedience is not going to come with the condemnation of those around me. It's going to come with the humility that is necessary for God to show me the path. Well, why won't God show me the path? Because guess who he resists? He resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. There is a, should be a desire to know the next step and to walk in the next step. A desire to overcome that which is contrary within us that we lust after to know the next step and to show the next step. Like preacher, I just don't really know. I think I'm doing pretty good. A walk with the Lord is a defeat of the flesh. Walking in the Spirit, ye shall fulfill the fruit of the Spirit. Walking in the flesh, ye shall fulfill the lust of the flesh. So are you winning? Are, are you even targeting the next step? Well, preacher, I've been serving God for a long time. I'm less concerned about the past steps than I'm more concerned about the next step. Yeah. Amen. Like, what's your next step? Well, I got a lot of sin. Next step, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Yeah, but I've been messing up on this sin a long time. Man, aren't you glad for the grace of God that your next step can be an obedient step? Amen. Hey, I don't know what your next step is, but it should be a desire to show the truth that you know. The love of Christ, obedience to God, a, a, a declaration of his word, a witness of him. Take the next step, faithfulness, service. Hey, I, I, I don't know the next step. God knows the next step. And if you don't know the next step, or if I don't know the next step, and shouldn't there be a craving to say, am I walking in truth in such a way that it would make him rejoice? Amen. Man, that'd be really cool. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Christianity is an active sport. I don't know about you, I'll close with this. We used to have this drill in football. I don't know if they're allowed to do it anymore. But you lay on your back, right, head to head, right? And they blow this whistle, and then you'd get up and turn around and destroy one another. It was awesome. Loved it. You know, and, they, and there would always be those kids that would be like kind of fading into the background. They'd be fading in the background. Then you'd have the meatheads like, yeah, me, me, again, again, yes, please. And they'd be fading in the background. You know, and the coach would say something like, listen, if you don't want to do this, you don't want to be out there. Because that's just a lot of that out there. And that lack of participation, man, they fade in the background. They didn't want to do it because it was difficult. Hey, your next step might be difficult. Well, you know what? I think I want to skip that step. You can't. Children of Israel tried to skip a step and they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Your next step might be difficult. And some of us, I know I've been there, where I've got to that step and I wouldn't take it and I go back and circle and wander and circle and wander and come back. It's like God's not going to let me go forward until I actually take that step. And sometimes Christians are like, it would be better for me just to sit here and dwell in the truth than to take that hard step and walk in the truth. It might be a forgiveness step. It might be a confession step. 
It might be a change of life step. But I'm telling you, God rejoices when Christians walk in the truth that they know. Lord, I pray that you'd help us.